Uh, okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is John Kraft. I work for Analog Devices, and the topic of this workshop is phased array beamforming, understanding, and prototyping. So I hope this will be a fun, perhaps a unique way to understand a few of these foundational concepts. Um, you might see, I don't know if you can see it, this little floating cable car behind me. Um, uh, that will be our grand finale, so, so stay tuned for that. Um, and since I'm doing some demos and I'm switching back and forth between PowerPoint, uh, I have pre-recorded a lot of this towards the, the, the later half of the presentation. But I'm speaking to you live right now. Um, uh, and then when we get to the recorded parts, I'll pause occasionally um, and we can uh, take questions and review anything in greater detail. Uh, just, just please post questions in that chat window um, and I can, uh, I'll, I'll try to look at them and, and, uh, and get to them during the presentation or, or after those parts of the presentation. Uh, so with that, let's talk about uh, the goals and agenda for this workshop. Um, you know, in the past several years, uh, you may have seen more and more people talking about uh, phased array beamforming uh, for, for communication and radar systems, you know, things like 5G, satellite, airborne, uh, military applications, they're all taking advantage of the benefits of phased array beamforming. However, when you're just getting started in this, it can sometimes be a little bit difficult to get a grasp on it all. It can feel like a lot of math and angles uh, to work through. So our first goal of this workshop is to demystify the phased array terminology and equip you with a basic understanding of its underlying principles. So what does it mean to form the beam? Uh, why does tapering matter so much? Uh, what is a grading lobe or beam squint? And then as we go through that theory and math behind phased array beam form, behind how phased array beamformers work, uh, we'll set up a live example of it in action using GNU radio and some simple hardware from analog devices. So you will see a grading lobe, uh, you will observe beam squint, uh, you, will, you will taper away those disastrous side lobes. So we start with the math and theory, but then if you're a little bit lost after that, then I think it will really help you to see these principles play out in real hardware. And then finally, our third goal of the workshop is to put it all together and to build before your very eyes a simplified version of a phased array tracker and I hope that doing so will be an interesting look into how you could use GNU Radio and the analog devices ecosystem to quickly prototype real world solutions. So first, we'll build up some hardware and a GNU Radio flow graph, and that will allow us to experiment directly with these concepts. And that will be the first thing that we walk through. And this is actual hardware controlled through GNU Radio that you can build and do your own experiments with. Um, and then we'll start with some simple math relating phase shift to steering angle. So we'll calculate how to point our beam uh, and what that means for phase shift. Uh, and then we'll go to our hardware setup and see if the math is true and, and see exactly what all that looks like. Uh, next, we'll carry that math a bit further and look at antenna patterns. So this, this is element factor, array factor, uh, side lobes, beam width, you know, th those kinds of things. Again, we start with the math and then we'll make the hardware measurements directly with GNU radio. And, and this becomes pretty interesting because we can manipulate the number of elements and the steering angle and see how that impacts the overall antenna pattern. Uh, then we'll continue using the hardware to show some common antenna impairments. So these are things like uh, beam squint, uh, grading lobes, uh, why we do beam tapering, uh, those kinds of things. And again, we'll do the theory and the math first, and then we'll use GNU Radio um, uh, to make uh, measurements on our hardware. Uh, in our final section, we'll upgrade our hardware into a true monopulse tracker. It's very cool, uh, but uh, we got to change our hardware a little bit, and this is what that upgraded hardware is going to look like. Uh, this gets a little bit more involved, and so you might not want to build this at home, but you certainly could, and I'll go through how to do that. Um, and as part of this, I will do a demo of how I do RF layout instantly and have boards assembled and delivered in just a few days. Uh, uh, and then finally, we put all together by building a real monopulse tracker that finds an RF source, locks into it, um, and locks into it as it moves across the room. So before we dig into any of that, uh, let me first do my best to acknowledge all the help I received on this. I am not a phased array expert, uh, or even <laughs> particularly good at math and programming. Um, I'm just a field applications engineer for analog devices. But in that role, I have a lot of phased array radar and comms customers here in Colorado. So I was looking for a way you know, to build my understanding of these concepts, but all of this can feel a little confusing and kind of nutty. It can feel like a lot of math and triangles and cosine theta and arc sine and lambda over D and, and you know, all this stuff. And so I wanted a way to construct a mock-up of how my customers typically used our beam formers and data converters. And then I could learn from that simplified mock-up. Uh, and GNU Radio really provided the perfect vehicle uh, to do that with. Uh, 
And so for sure, I need to thank those that helped me in this journey. Bob Broughton, he's a, he's a great design leader and teacher at Analog Devices. He kind of got me started on this path. Uh, Bob is responsible for many of our phased array beamforming chips at Analog Devices. Uh, Pete Delos, another great technical leader at ADI, with, and he has extensive radar experience. Uh, you may have seen some of Pete's phased array beamforming papers on analog.com. He really does a great job of explaining the material. And recently, Pete, Bob, and I wrote an article in Analog Dialog. It's essentially what's covered in this workshop, uh, but it, and it's a nice, unintimidating explanation of many of the phased array beamforming basics. And so in this workshop, we're basically putting those explanations in math to the test uh, using a hardware setup and GNU radio. And for me, it was really that hands-on part of this project that drove home these beamforming concepts. And that could not have been done without the foundation and help from those on the hardware side. So uh, this SDG group with their tools and hardware and device drivers, uh, many of you uh, I'm sure know of this group, they're frequent speakers and contributors to GNU Radio. And Robin and Travis in particular really encouraged me on the benefits of using, uh, using uh, uh, GNU Radio for this. Uh, special thanks to Ozan who designed our X-Band uh, patch antenna, that's available to everyone. And uh, a shout out to Mr. Paul Clark for his excellent and I think very accessible books on using GNU Radio with an SDR. When my colleagues ask me how to get started with software defined radio, I say, get a Pluto, get a Raspberry Pi, and get Paul Clark's books. These books have helped me a lot when I was just getting started with GNU Radio. Uh, okay, so before we dig into the fun stuff, let me just give uh, just a quick overview of beamforming, beamforming and some typical applications for it. I've kind of been, been staring at the slides though. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, let's just go through that quickly. So traditionally, um, we've used antennas such as what's shown here. These have a fixed mechanical shape and, and it's that fixed shape that controls the antenna pattern. And then it's mechanically rotated in direction and elevation. In a phased array, uh, we also want to steer the beam but without any mechanical movement. So there's a whole series of elements and generally the entire array is flat. And then the beam steering is accomplished by controlling the phase or time delay across these elements. So the beam steering is all done elect electronically. And in fact, you can't tell by looking at the antenna where it's pointed. Uh, so there's no need for mechanical rotation. And this is a, a huge reliability benefit for phased arrays. Uh, okay, so where are these phased array beamformers used? Uh, we often see them in three main areas, uh, mobile comms like 5G and automotive, uh, commercial military radar, and satellite communications. Uh, so first, mobile communications. Uh, most of today's uh, cell phone towers use antennas with fixed beams like that of a street lamp. And as a result, energy is radiated in unneeded directions. But future 5G radio systems will use beamforming to create narrow searchlight beams that will stay focused on each user uh, even as they move. Uh, next, consider radar. Traditional radar uh, often uses a mechanically steered narrow beam to provide selective coverage. But phased array radars use ele electronically variable phase shifters, and this permits uh, very fast scanning. Um, and in fact, they can track multiple targets and while simultaneously carrying out searches uh, for new targets. Uh, finally, in satellite communications, we're seeing many low Earth orbit uh, satellite constellations uh, being launched now. These have orbital periods of as little as 90 minutes. And so both the satellite and the ground terminals have comms links that are constantly acquiring, tracking, and then reacquiring. So the rapid non-mechanical nature of phased arrays, as well as the ability to track multiple targets simultaneously is a big advantage over fixed mechanical antennas. Okay, so that's a general overview of what we mean by phased array beamforming, but I learned best hands-on. And so now let's build this, this simple beamformer. And, and then we'll use this throughout this workshop um, to play with these beamforming principles. Oh, comment on my graphics. Yeah, I had to, <laughs> I had to, I, I, uh, there's a special website for internal analog devices people who can get, uh, get those fancy Marcom graphics that are uh, approved for public distribution. Anyway. <laughs> um, and everyone can still see the slides. So did I lose anybody? Browser refresh. Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, in this section, I want to quickly walk you through step-by-step step how you could build a setup of your very own phased array beamformer using some hardware from analog devices and of course, GNU Radio. Uh, the complete build instructions and all the software is available uh, at this uh, GitHub link here, and it all runs in GNU Radio 3.8. Okay, so what do we need to make a phased array beamformer? Um, let's quickly walk through what the ingredients are there. We'll need some kind of an, of an antenna, uh, we'll need uh, some kind of a phase shifter. Um, we'll need a mixer if we want to reach any of the higher frequencies. 
We need some kind of transceiver or data converter. Um, so uh, uh, we'll use Pluto for the first half of, the, of these labs. And then of course, software. And here's how, uh, here's how all of those pieces would fit together. So this is how our basic setup is all gonna be connected here. This is just the basics uh, to get a working setup. I mean, obviously a real implementation would be far more thorough, but just focusing on the basics allows us to build up something quickly that we can use and explore. Uh, so we'll start with this four element setup and then later on we'll switch to an eight element hybrid beamformer um, and that will give us true monopole signal tracking. Uh, so in this setup here, you can see my pointer here. So in this setup here, uh, um, we generate this little 10.5 gigahertz signal from this little black box, uh, which, which uh, we'll discuss later in a few slides. And that signal shines down at an angle determined by our selfie stand on our four element patch antenna. The ADAR1000 receives it and controls the gain and phase shift of each of those four signals. Um, it then sums those phase shifted signals together uh, and delivers that to this LTC5552 mixer. Now for the LO of that mixer, we use Pluto's transmitter as just a crude LO. It, it's only to simplify our setup. This is not how it would normally be done. Um, you do not need to write any comments in the chat window about I'm doing it wrong. That's, it's, it, it simplifies our setup and, and it works well enough for this simple example here. Um, and that mixes down to something in the range of Pluto. Uh, and then uh, using the LibIO drivers, we stream that data to an embedded Linux device, which is our Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, and then use GNU Radio to view the data and control ADAR1000 and Pluto. Uh, and, and you can build this. Uh, there's a bomb and step-by-step -step instructions at this link. I'll highlight some of the steps right now, but, but otherwise just go to this link and it'll, it'll walk you through it all. Um, the first and probably most important piece of this is this ADAR1000 IC. It controls the phase and gain of, of the four channels and then, and then sums them together. Or you can switch it to transmit mode and then it, and then it splits one beam into four channels, control, again controls the gain in phase, and then outputs those to, a, uh, to four antenna elements. But for our setup, we're just doing receive mode with the ADAR1000. So we're using these paths that are shown. Um, so it goes through, on the receive uh, side, it goes through a phase shifter uh, and then a, um, a, a, a block to control the gain. And then it goes through a summer, all four of these elements get summed together and they get output to our mixer. And our lab needs some kind of RF source to track um, and it needs to be in the range of the ADAR1000. So it needs to be somewhere between eight and 16 gigahertz. Uh, a shout out to Mr. Chuck Dewey who clued me into this little one here, the HB100. Uh, the HB100 is intended uh, as a 10.5 gigahertz radar for use in like uh, occupancy sensors. And when I say 10.5 gigahertz, I mean, it is supposed to be 10.5 gigahertz. I've seen anything from 10.1 to 10.8 gigahertz. And it's not a great tone. Um, it doesn't have great spectral purity. It doesn't have great frequency stability. You'll see it move uh, slowly as it warms up. You'll see it change over time. Um, but you know, it's good enough for us. It's very cheap. It's low power. It's readily available. And, uh, and so that's what we'll use today. And uh, I built a little holder for it. It's a little STL file if you want a 3D print one for yourself. That holder mounts onto this little selfie stand here. And we'll use a stand through most of the labs today. It allows us to center our antenna and then rotate the RF source around it. And then we can measure the actual angle and compare that to our beam forming measurements. So that's, that's a nice benefit because we are trying to double check all of our math here. Uh, speaking of antenna, this is probably the hardest part to find. If you have a local analog devices salesperson, uh, you could contact them and they can probably uh, get you one of the ones that we built. Or if you click this link, you can buy one from PCBWay. They're, they're pretty inexpensive. Uh, also a shout out to Mr. Kent Britton. He is an incredible antenna designer who does custom antenna work for a very affordable fee. He made a 10 gigahertz uh, antenna with a 15 millimeter element spacing. And that will also make use of throughout the labs. Uh, it's a uh, um, it's a nice spacing that kind of shows shows some of the features, especially when we get to get to grading lobes. Finally, the software. Um, let me spend a little bit of time here. So this is easy to set up if you have a Raspberry Pi. Just download ADI's version of Raspbian, uh, which is called uh, Coopier. It's basically Raspberry Pi OS, but with all the ADI libraries preloaded. So it has GNU Radio 3.8, it has Pi ADI IIO, uh, all the LibIO stuff. It's all there. It's all ready to go. Um, 
Uh, and then just go to my GitHub site and you can download the Guinea Radio files individually. Or, or you can um, download it all together packaged up here. So this raspy.7z file has GNU Radio 3.8.1 and everything. This is exactly a duplication of my setup. It probably even has my Wi-Fi passwords uh, on there. So if you ever are at my house, you can you can use my Wi-Fi. Um, everything is there. All the GNU Radio files are there. You may still want to update them um, from the phased array directory here on this GitHub site because in a few weeks I may have found some mistakes or something, and I'll I won't redo this file, but I'll probably redo the the phase array folder with any corrections. Um, and so if you just download this, you can install it directly to, to uh, an SD card for your Raspberry Pi, and uh, it'll all just work out of the box. Um, for more background on any of these Pi installs, uh, as well as how to use Python with GNU Radio and our ADI libraries, I highly recommend Mark Thorne's workshop that he did uh, he, two days ago. Um, it's called Python for the Rest of Us. Um, and to be clear, I learned as much as I could from Mark uh, and Travis Collins and Robin Getz, but I am still learning. So anything you see me doing wrong in the, in the programming, is me being a bad student, uh, not them being a bad teacher, uh, but I'm trying to do my best. Um, and as we go through the labs, we'll, I'll explain the individual Python and the GNU radio flow graphs. So I'll hold off on discussing those until then. And here's what the entire thing looks like all assembled. Um, Raspberry Pi, Pluto, ADAR1000, the LTC5552 mixer, uh, and then the selfie stand with the RF source on it and the, uh, the um, 10 and a half gigahertz patch antenna. The first half of this workshop uses Pluto, and then the second half, uh, we switch to this ADRV 9361 SOM. It gives us two receive channels. Um, and I should point out too that for Pluto, you'll need to apply the frequency expansion hack to it. So this opens up the max sample rate and the range of our frequencies that Pluto can do. I think nearly everyone has probably done that already, but uh, if you haven't, there's lots of good wikis out there on how to do it, and it's very easy. Okay, so that was on how to kind of build our setup. And now let's get into a little bit of the math and we'll fire up your new radio and I uh, will try to prove if, if the math is uh, is working well. And I mean, hopefully we'll find that, you know, um, that the calculations on the next few slides for steering angle will match what our new radio uh, measure, uh, measurements uh, give us. So first let's, let's understand why and exactly uh, how to control the phase. Okay, so we're going to have some kind of beam forming antenna, and that's composed of an array of n individual elements. Uh, it'll probably be in a linear or two dimensional configuration. Um, in our lab, we're going to use four linear elements, and they will be spaced an equal distance apart. But shown in this figure are eight linear elements, um, and they're also spaced an equal distance apart. And the signals at the elements are combined in such a way that um, that signals at a particular angle are constructively summed while other angles experience destructive interference. And it's the phase shift of each element that optimizes this combination. So let's, uh, let's look at two examples to illustrate how this happens. So here I show uh, four elements from a patch antenna uh, configured to receive an incoming signal. And our goal is to match the delays from each element such that they combine in sync to form the largest possible combined amplitude. So here's our wave front coming in at about a 45 degree angle. It strikes the first element. That first element is programmed to, to uh, um, uh, 3x the delay. Then our wave front strikes the second element, which is programmed to two times the delay. And then it strikes the third element, and that is programmed to one times the delay. Then the, our wave front strikes the fourth element, and this has no delay. And these um, the delays are selected such that when they reach the summer, they all arrive at the same time and uh, and uh, uh, they arrive in, in sync. So if we set each of the delays just right, we can see that each element has a different delay such that the signal as it strikes each element gets combined synchronously. Now let's, um, now let's imagine that same case with the same set of delays applied, but now the wavefront is coming in um, perpendicular to the antenna. So this direction is what we call the mechanical boresight or the broadside direction. And so here's our wavefront coming in now from the broadside direction. It strikes all the elements at the same time, but each element is configured for a different delay. And that causes um, the, that fourth element to pass through first, then third element, then the second element, um, and then the first element. Uh, and the result is that there is no coherent combining, uh, which results in a much smaller summation uh, at the output. Uh, 
So let's take our four element setup and consider the math behind how we need to optimally set those delays. You can see that our wave front is the, uh, is the hypotenuse in a simple triangle with the array of elements. D is the distance between elements and the angle from mechanical foresight, which is also, uh, mechanical foresight is also called the broadside direction. Um, that angle is theta. And if we form another right triangle with the wave front and theta, we can calculate L, which is the incremental propagation distance between the elements. So, and I'm going to define theta in relation to that broadside direction. Um, other derivations will define it relative to the, um, to the horizon. So in those treatments, you'll see a cosine theta instead of a sine theta, but it's all the same. It's just a different definition scheme, but it's something you'll wanna pay attention to uh, as you read through other phase array material. Okay, so that simple triangle gives us three ways to describe the element to element delay. We could describe it as an incremental distance that the wavefront must travel to strike the adjacent element, and that incremental distance is L. Uh, or we could describe it as a time delay between elements, uh, which is just the distance L divided by the speed of light. Uh, or we could describe it as a phase shift. Um, but that phase shift is really just the time delay at one particular frequency. So if our frequency changes, our phase shift needs to change in order to keep the time delay the same. But for relatively narrow bandwidths, uh, phase shift is a very good approximation to the time delay. For wider bandwidths, if we don't compensate for that the frequency change, then we can get into an issue called beam squint, uh, which we'll discuss later. But phase shifts are generally much easier to implement than time delays. So we often use phase shifts um, when what we ultimately may, may want is really more of a time delay. Okay, so that's the math behind. Um... Oh, uh, let's see, let me pause here for a question here. Uh, da, 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 da. Two questions, one is Pluto oh, on that frequency uh, hack that I did on Pluto. Uh, have the correct radio chip? No, um, it it should it should work it should work for all of them. There's uh, I should I'll post the link uh, somewhere, um, or maybe if Mark Thorne's online, uh, maybe he he could post it to the notes section. But there's a there's a wiki.analog page that explains uh, how to do that hack on Pluto. And then uh, from Richard Stanley, what are the implications of not using D as lambda over two? Ah, yes, uh, a fantastic question, Richard. And um, when we discuss grading lobes, we are gonna talk about this because that lambda over two spacing gu guideline, it's a guideline and, it, and it's, it's valid, but um, there's reasons that we often violate it. And uh, it's, it's very interesting. There's, there's a little bit of math and this funky arc sign, uh, you know, thing that we'll talk about, but it's it's very interesting, and when we get to the the measurements, I think it'll be I think it'll be very illuminating to see how changing that spacing plays out. Yeah. On okay. This, uh, good questions. Oh, hey, hey, Robin. So I I never describe uh, the Pluto thing as a hack. All you're doing is just lying to the software. Okay, it's a lie, not a hack. That's what you're exactly. Saying. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, uh, Mr. Robin Getz. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for your. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, th uh, thanks, Robin. Yeah, there's there's the link there. Yes, we we would never hack our stuff. We would only lie. Good. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, so we did a simple math between um, how we would match two elements to the incoming wavefront, um, but we only did it for two elements, right? And um, so how do we go from two elements to ten thousand elements? Right now, we kind of have this situation where we have our RF source you know, and it's pointed and um, and each element may have a slightly different angle um, to that RF source. And uh, and that and that makes that makes the math hard to work out for setting all the individual delays. But if we just assumed that the RF source was far away, um, then all then we'd have this situation and all of our paths to the elements would be approximately parallel. Therefore, all the steering angles, all the thetas would be equal and, and uh, or approximately equal. And each element would simply have a path length that is d sine theta longer than its neighbor. And so this, this far field approximation greatly simplifies the math. And it means that uh, for an equally spaced array, that when we solve for one phase shift, we can use that same phase shift um, for all the neighbor, neighboring elements. Uh, so the question always comes up, uh, how far is far, you know, when can we safely use this far field approximation? There's, um, there's lots of simple far field calculators online, uh, but for our setup, uh, we have four elements at, 10, at around 10 gigahertz, um, and you can work out that the far field is considered anything greater than about 142 millimeters. <laughs> 
Um, and that's not very far. So for our lab, uh, we're, we're totally safe. But you can see from this equation that if we had a very large array, then the far field might be several kilometers. Um, so it is something to consider in a real design. So using the equation for the element to element phase shift, uh, we can steer our beam to a particular example, uh, to a particular angle. And so here's an example of, of how we would use that math. If we had an RF source at 30 degrees from mechanical bore site, then we can use the equations that we just went through to compute that we need a 94 degrees phase shift from element to element all the way across the array. And doing that will steer our antenna to 30 degrees. So we can, uh, we can try that out now. So we built our setup um, and then we did just a tiny bit of math to understand how to set that element to element delay. Uh, and we saw that, that's, that, that setting that delay will give us the steering angle. So the steering angle again is the electrical bore side of our antenna. It's the direction that our phased array antenna has maximum gain. Let's now configure GNU radio to use our hardware to perform a simple check on that beam steering math. All right, we're finally ready to start using GNU Radio. Uh, so I've installed ADI Cooper Linux, it has GNU Radio 3.8 on there. Um, and uh, we are, gave you the links and instructions on how to do that already. So we can launch GNU Radio. This is all running on the Raspberry Pi 4. And here's our first GNU radio flow graph. We're just gonna use this to change the phase on the ADAR 1000 and measure the response a, on an FFT. So to do that, I'm using the standard Pluto sync and source blocks. Those are found um, over here in the industrial IO library. The Pluto sync block I'm using um, as a transmitter to transmit 5.8 gigahertz as, a, as kind of a crude LO to our mixer, just to simplify our setup. And then the Pluto receive block is, is receiving the data uh, from the mixer um, after it gets phase shifted through the ADAR 1000. And then we, we plot that received data with the QT GUI sync. The, uh, the actual control of the ADAR 1000 and the phase shifting is done in this Python block here. This is just the standard Python block found in the miscellaneous tree. Uh, earlier this week, Wiley Standage Beer did a great workshop entitled Writing GNU Radio Blocks, and he went into detail on all the different blocks and, and how to use them. Um, and in a moment, we can uh, open this up in the editor and we can see what, uh, what, what my Python uh, script looks like. Uh, but to pass parameters from the GUI into this block, um, I use the variable name of the GUI item and place it in these fields here. I think there's a probably a better way to do this, uh, you know, by naming the variables the same, uh, and then it should register a callback function. But I couldn't get this to work reliably, so I just use this method, and, and it works okay. Um, so the important things I am grabbing from the GUI are the phase delta and the phase values for RX1 to RX4. These have a, a cal coefficient also that you can see uh, applied to them to correct for some of the phase mismatch between the cables. I don't go into how to do that in this presentation, but I'll include a few extra slides um, on it in the slide deck that I distribute. It's pretty easy though, um, and it'll make more sense uh, when we look at the antenna patterns. And now let's take a look at what that uh, GNU radio uh, block script looks like. So this is the overview of the Python block. Um, some helpful links here at the beginning for anyone that's uh, that's interested or, or uh, wants to take a look. Of course, all the ADI legalese don't, uh, don't make sure to read this. Don't don't use this in a pacemaker and blame analog devices. Okay, um, standard standard import um, kind of commands uh, import spy dev so that I have control of the Raspberry Pi spy ports so I can program the ADR one thousand. And then here's the uh, the the uh, boilerplate for this um, the standard GNU Radio Python block. We only have one output, and the output is the steering angle, just to give us an indicator. We're going to pull in a few variables. The variables that we pull in are, are uh, the things that allow us to adjust the, the phase calibration, uh, con control the phase state if we don't want exactly uniform phase delta steps. Now we just open the, the SPI port on, on the Raspberry Pi so that we can communicate with the ADAR 1000. There's several uh, SPI commands here for the ADAR 1000 that are, that are in the ADAR 1000 data sheet. Uh, reset the device and configure it, set it up. Um, and then configure it for, for max gain and zero phase shift. Then the rest of this is a, is a work function loop. 
that as we change a phase delta slider bar, slider bar, we're going to update the phase states on the ADAR 1000. So we'll, we'll calculate what those need to be in this loop here. And then we'll write them all out uh, to the proper register within the ADAR 1000. It's not so important that we go over this, but then there's a, there's a big phase table here. Um, and this is in the ADAR 1000 data sheet and um, goes through all the different possible combinations of, um, of phases per receive or transmit channel. And then what those, uh, what those spy rights would be. And the table is quite long because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of phase states that's, um, it's a, uh, that the ADAR 1000 could use. So we go through the bottom and then the very last command is to update the ADAR 1000 with those new states and then to output the steering angle that we used for that. So that's about all there is to that flow graph. So that's enough of the background. The rest are just a couple of uh, variables and labels. Um, that's enough of the background. Let's finally uh, go ahead and fire this guy up. All right, and here's that flow graph running. You see an uh, FFT of the received data from Pluto. Uh, I can change this to RF frequencies. <clears throat> Our signal here is at 10.508 gigahertz. And uh, I can, we know it's that signal, I can turn it off and on. There it's off, now it's back on. And um, we can uh, adjust the center frequency here by changing the receive LO on Pluto. Uh, we can also change the gain if we need to, to increase or decrease that signal. But the real, uh, the real thing to do here is control the ADAR 1000 phase shifters. So this top bar here is the phase delta. It's the element to element phase shift. And then here's the individual phase shift if we wanted to further add or adjust that like we might during calibration. So this phase delta here, um, let me just uh, show you an example. If I, if I set this phase delta to 25 degrees, that means that element one is zero degrees. That's our reference. Element two is at 25 degrees. It's 25 plus zero. Uh, element three is 25 degrees different from element two. So 25 plus 25 is 50 degrees. And then element four is 25 degrees above that. So this is for a positive 25 degree phase delta. You know, we can also do, of course, uh, uh, negative phase deltas here. Here's negative 25, and we just uh, loop back through 360 to calculate those phase deltas. Uh, let me turn on max hold and min hold, and uh, maybe zoom in, I guess. So here's max hold and min hold. Um, just take a look at, at what happens as I sweep this phase delta. Sweep the phase delta. So the signal goes down and then it kind of pops back up and it kind of goes up again, then it goes down again. All right, and now I'll return back towards zero. All right, and right around zero, it's kind of kind of at its peak there. And now I'll go, go a negative phase delta. And again, you can see it, uh, see it drop down there again into some kind of null. And then it pops back up again and then down again. So this is interesting, right? Because when we computed the, uh, the phase delta, there was nothing that would give us any indication of these other peaks and nulls in, in here. We're gonna look at those in greater depth when we look at the antenna pattern, but for just now, for right now, it's kind of a curiosity. So what we want is the peak of those individual peaks, which occurs right around, it's kind of flat, but it occurs, you know, somewhere around zero degrees. And that's correct because you can probably see from the webcam that our antenna is pointed at zero degrees. So a uh, zero degree steering angle is a zero degrees phase shift. Uh, so all the elements are at zero degrees. Okay, uh, but the calculation that we had done was for a phase shift of 30 degrees. So let me now move this over. And um, the selfie stand kind of locks in 15 degree increments. So that should be 30, but let me check it with my, um, the compass app on my cell phone. So I don't know if you can see that, but uh, according to my iPhone, that angle is about 30 degrees. So, so we're, we're about right. Okay, now uh, let me reset the, the min and the max. 
you probably noticed that with a phase shift of zero degrees, our amplitude went down. So let's uh, let's shift shift this guy. Let's first go negative. So this would be negative steering angles. Now we're moving at negative, and um, we see the peak go down, uh, goes back up, and then goes down again a little bit. All right. Now let's bring it around positive. Bring it back to zero. And, uh, and now we're going to move it into positive phase deltas. Oh, and now we see it start start to grow. Uh, our gain is increasing, and now it's starting to decrease, and it's dropping low again. Okay, so what we want is the very peak there, which is somewhere somewhere right around here. It's a little hard to tell the peak because it's kind of flat, and we'll learn about um, beam width later on. But our, our beam width is, is pretty broad, so. Uh, so somewhere around here seems to be the peak of all of our peaks. It's a 98 degrees uh, phase delta. That corresponds to a 31 degree steering angle. So I don't know, we're about a degree off, I guess. We had calculated that that steering angle should be 94 degrees. That would give us exactly a 30 degree um, steering uh, uh, angle. So that, that phase delta should be 94 degrees to give a 31 degree steering angle. Uh, so we're uh, we're pretty close. We're not We're not too far off. And uh, so that math seems to check out. The next thing we're going to do might be a little bit more interesting. We're going to we're going to plot out this whole intended pattern, and we're going to look for peaks and nulls, and 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 find out what those mean. So we just finished looking at steering angle, uh, and we saw a peak where we calculated it would be. So that's so that's good news. But we also saw some smaller peaks and some deep nulls uh, as we varied that phase delta. And that was not predicted from our beam steering equation. So where do those come from? What do they mean? Um, we need to work out a little bit of math in order to understand it. And then we'll modify our GNU radio flow graph uh, to be able to experiment with it. To start uh, with that math, let's first consider that the total intended gain is actually a function of two parts, uh, the element factor and the array factor. The element factor is the radiating pattern from a single element of the array. This is defined by the construction of the element, and it's not something that we can change electrically. So we'll just leave it as a constant in our analysis. The array factor is the portion of the antenna gain that we can influence by beamforming. So let's understand uh, what that looks like. Remember that all of our analysis and experiments are for a linear array, specifically a four by one equally spaced linear array. Uh, but a linear array is the building block from which many other array types can spring out of. So uh, it is very useful and instructive um, to start with this. Um, the array factor for a linear array is derived in many places, but here's just sort of a simple overview of it. Uh, we basically sum the signals from each element uh, with their phase shift, um, and then we do some math and some substitutions to simplify. And then normalizing it uh, gives this equation down here in red that's shown. And for this workshop, we don't need to rederive the equation. The important part um, is that uh, the end result is this sine n over n times sine uh, equation. And it's not intuitively obvious what this equation means, so let's plot out a few cases. Here's the array factor plotted for different numbers of elements. Now, uh, I'll give you a moment to digest this. X is the steering axis. Um, I mean, the, the, the steering angle, and this is just a function of the phase delta. And now we could plot phase delta on the x-axis, but most of us don't think in terms of phase delta. Uh, but, you, but you will actually sometimes see phase delta plotted on that axis because then the, the plot is independent of frequency and spacing. Uh, so in this plot, you can see that as the number of elements uh, n increases, that the main lobe beam width narrows and the, and the number of uh, uh, lobes and nulls increases. We'll discuss side lobes when we go through beam tapering, but for now the important bit is to recognize that our beam becomes more tightly focused as we increase the number of elements. And this is very desirable, and it's the reason you often see phased arrays of thousands of elements. Uh, and the gain also increases, but you don't see that from this equation because we normalized it. So with the array factor that we derived, uh, we now have an equation related to n, the number of elements, to find the beam width of the main lobe. And commonly, this is measured at its half power beam width. Um, this is the main lobe beam width measured 3 dB down from its peak. So solving that equation um, gives a half power beam width of 25 degrees for a four element array. And you can see how it increases with decreasing elements. Um, three elements gives a 34 degree beam width and, um, and two elements gives a very large 56 degree beam width. 
Similarly, we can also look um, uh, at the this array factor equation and uh, and and look at the null to null spacing. So we just solve the array factor equation for when it's equal to zero. So for a four element array at 10.5 gigahertz, it has 56 degree null to null spacing in the main lobe. And you can see as, as you go down the number of elements, that null to null spacing increases. Uh, okay, so now we have a quick understanding of what our antenna pattern should look like, um, and we have some numbers to determine how close our GNU radio setup is to these theoretical values. So let's uh, let's give this a try in GNU radio. Okay, so let's take a look at that our, uh, that new GNU radio flow graph. Uh, it looks a little bit different. But uh, the main difference now is that instead of using the Pluto sync and source blocks, we now put all of that into the Python block. The other functions up here, most of these are variables and slider boxes that will become evident once we launch the GUI. And then uh, these, all these guys over here are, are labels that um, we're going to use when we talk about Beam squint. So pretty much everything now happens within this, this Python block here. So we can go ahead and open that. So this is the Python block running in GNU radio that controls uh, most of the Pluto functions and ADAR 1000 functions now. Uh, we can scroll past the boilerplate. Of course we have uh, all of our standard libraries to import. Um, all the ADAR 1000 functions are essentially the same as our last flow graph. I've just put them into function form so that we can call them more easily. I, I guess I should have done that on the on the first flow graph. Um, um, but essentially all these things that we do to set phase are now in function format. And it's particularly useful here because we're gonna keep looping through and we're gonna keep setting the phase over and over and over again to look at the antenna pattern. So we scroll down through all those things. These are all uh, commands to set different phase deltas on the ADAR 1000. Okay, and finally we get down to this 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 work block here, which should look pr pretty familiar. It follows the standard uh, Python block boilerplate. Uh, but now we have a few more variables to pull in because we're also controlling Pluto. So we pull in Pluto's IP address and uh, and its LO frequencies gain. Um, and uh, now we're going to use the uh, Pi ADI IIO interface that Travis Collins developed and greatly simplifies the Python programming of Pluto and, and gathering data from Pluto. So uh, many, many thanks to Travis for, for his work on that and his, uh, his help and examples on, on generating these commands. So we, uh, uh, we initialize Pluto. I need to set my buffer count to one because I just want to, I want to change the phase state on the ADAR 1000. I want to grab one buffer of data and then I want to quickly move to the to a new beam state. And doing that greatly speeds up my um, uh, my sweep time, but it also means that I don't have stale data in Pluto. I haven't I haven't changed the, the phase state, and then I'm grabbing a new buffer, and I'm I'm grabbing a buffer that represents an, a previous phase state, and so so I need to change the number of buffer of buffers that Pluto stores, which is normally four. I need to change that to one. So this is the command uh, to do that. Uh, thank you to Travis for <laughs> for the help on that. He, he's the one who gave me that. Um, uh, the rest of this is pretty similar to, to other examples that Travis Collins has online. And uh, here we're gonna here we're gonna set our tone for our crude uh, transmitter LO, and uh, just configure the rest of the Pluto functions. And then we get into our work loop here. Each iteration of our, loop, our work loop, we're gonna uh, check the the LO frequency to see if we need to change that, and the and the gain of Pluto to see if we need to change that. There's some taper functions here that we're gonna get into when we talk about beam impairments. And uh, the rest is is pretty similar actually to the previous flow graph, except that now we're running this in a loop, uh, in a big loop here where uh, we go through, we grab a buffer of data from Pluto, and then we do an FFT on it and calculate uh, uh, the peak gain of that FFT. And we can do that a few times if we want to average average that result. And then we store that that gain value. So in our previous example, we were we were, um, changing the phase delta on the ADAR 1000 and we and, and we could see the FFT peak change. Now all I want is just that peak value. I throw away all the, all the other numbers and I store that with a steering angle and that steering angle and peak gain is what gets output uh, out of this uh, 
Python block. And finally, we can run this Python block. Let's go ahead and do that now. Okay, so this is actually pretty cool. This is the antenna pattern, and I'll give you a moment to digest this a bit. Right now, you can probably see from the webcam that we're still at that 30 degree angle that we had set from our previous exercise. So we had seen some peaks and valleys, but it was kind of hard to picture them in our, in our previous exercise. Now they're quite readily apparent. The x-axis here is not in phase, it is, uh, and the y-axis is not quadrature. I don't know how to change this. If anybody knows, uh, please, please let me know. But I can remove the axis entirely, but that also removes the numbers. But I don't know how to change in phase and quadrature. I, maybe there's an easy way to do it, but I, I, I don't know what it is. Anyway, um, the, the, the x-axis is actually the steering angle, and the y-axis is the, uh, the peak signal. So you can see here our peak si signal is at uh, minus 7.3 dB, and uh, it occurs at about a 31 degree steering angle. That's exactly what we got in our last exercise. Uh, so that's good. And then we see these uh, uh, these these other peaks and nulls here that that that, um, uh, that are a result of that array factor equation. So uh, let me show you how this changes as we move this RF source around. So if I move it straight up and down. Uh, here's mechanical boresight. I'll try to move my hand out of the way. There's mechanical boresight back to a plus 30 degree steering angle. We can keep going further and further. Uh, now we're starting to see a grading lobe appear on the opposite horizon. We'll talk about that uh, in another section. Move it back here to zero degrees. We can move it to the left. Note a little bit of beam widening too as we move as we move off of mechanical bore site. That's, that's interesting. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit later. So if I, if I return this steering angle here to zero degrees, that's mechanical bore sites. And we now get this kind of a pattern. Um, and we can make some measurements off of this. Uh, we talked about a few that we could do. We could measure the half power beam width and the null to null spacing. Let's go ahead and do that now. We can kind of, kind of get a approximate, uh, some, num some approximate numbers. I'm gonna go ahead and stop this just so it, it doesn't move around on us. And we can look at the peak here. Of course, it's zero degrees. Our steering angle is just about zero degrees. Um, and our peak is at uh, say minus eight. So I go three dB down and then I'm gonna measure the width um, on either side. And that will be my half power band, half power bandwidth. So uh, three dB down over here to 11 and then over. So we're at minus, about minus 13 there. And I go over here and that's about plus 13. So that's about a 26 degree half power beam width. And we had calculated it to be a 25 degree uh, for an N equals four array. And then we can look at the, the null to null spacing also. So this, this null here is at a steering angle of minus 31 degrees. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, of, of minus 27 degrees. And over here, it's at about uh, plus 26 degrees. So about 50, 57 degrees, and we had calculated that to be 56 degrees. So, so our math so far kind of checks out um, for, for, for looking at the null to null spacing and the half power beam width. So now let's try varying the number of elements and see what happens to the, the null to null spacing and half power beam width. So let me start up our, uh, Start this guy back up again, so it's updating again live. Now, um, to change the number of elements, right now we have four elements. They're all at a, a maximum gain, but I can attenuate any of these elements down using the ADAR1000 amplitude controls. And by attenuating them down, I'm, I'm basically uh, removing them. So let's kill off one of these elements here. Let's kill off RX1. We kill off RX1, and you see right away how fat this, this half power beam width got now. I can quickly go back. Here's what it looks like, n equals four. And then this is n equals three, right? I mean, a pretty pretty dramatic difference. And of course we can go even, even uh, lower to an n equals two, n equals two, very dramatic now, very wide half power beam width. Again, here's, here's what it looked like, n equals four. And here's n equals two. Half power beam width increased, our, our gain decreased, because obviously we have, we have half the number of elements now. Um, 
Let's go ahead and, uh, and re-enable all four of our elements. Let me see what that looks like again. Okay. Uh, there's one other uh, measurement that I'd like to make, and that is the peak of the side lobe, lobe levels and how far down they are from the main lobe. So here our main lobe was at uh, minus eight, and the side lobes are around minus, minus 18. So that's about 10 dB down. Um, and uh, that's going to be interesting when we when we look at our next section here, where we talk about side lobes. And then uh, one final thing, we, we we looked at it briefly, but that beam widening that occurs as we steer off of mechanical bore site, that's that's what we're going to talk about briefly next. But you can see right here it was what do we measure? 26 degrees, and then as we steer off, it gets uh, it gets wider and wider. And that was not predicted by our simplified array factor equation, but it is something that we can, we can take a look at now. So we just looked at the antenna pattern with our GNU radio program. Uh, and we saw that as we moved the um, RF source away from mechanical bore site, the, uh, the, uh, the broadside direction, we saw that that beam width actually got a little bit wider um, as we moved away. Um, and, our, and our previous, Array factor equation uh, was simplified just for mechanical uh, bore sites. So, um, so if the steering angle is not mechanical bore site, then this uh, this slightly longer equation here um, is uh, is actually the one that that we're going to want to use. And this sine theta term here, this this distorts our beam and widens the the beam width. It's like viewing the array from a high incident angle. You you only see a fraction of the surface area of the array. Uh, culminating at a viewing angle of, of 90 degrees where you would not see uh, the 2D line at all. You would just see, you just see a point, right? So um, here's, uh, here's this equation here plotted out for a lambda over two spacing. Uh, this one right here is right at mechanical bore site and then at, at uh, uh, 30 degrees off and uh, steering angle of 60 degrees. Note how the beam width gets wider as you move off of broadside. But the side lobe levels um, are basically remain uh, remain unchanged. Um, we'll actually see a little bit of change in these, uh, which I'll explain on, on the next slide. So up until now, we've only looked at the array factor, and, and that's the part we can control by varying the gain and phase of each antenna element. Um, but we also need to be aware of the element factor. That's the contribution from the mechanical design of the antenna element. It's not electrically adjustable, um, but it still has some radiating pattern that we need to multiply with the array factor. Uh, so here we here we just give uh, it a common cosine squared shape, and um, and note the impact here as we steer away from broadside on the antenna gain uh, on the antenna gain and the side lobe levels. So as we do our, our GNU radio experiments, just keep this in mind. We'll we'll get the best correlation to our simple equations if we're right at mechanical bore site. As we deviate away from there, uh, there there may be some um, some gain loss due to the the uh, element factor rolling off. And here's a nice summary of all those measurements that we made. Okay, now that we have a foundation in how a phased array antenna works, let's look at the ways they aren't so great and what we can do to correct or avoid uh, these problems. We'll talk about three types of antenna impairments, side lobes, grading lobes, and beam squint. And for each, we'll talk about how we can trade off some antenna design parameters to minimize their effect. We'll start with side lobes and talk about the impact of tapering. Uh, then we'll cover grading lobes and understand that lambda over two spacing guideline, uh, which you may have heard of before. Finally, we'll look at this thing called beam squint and we'll understand the impact of our earlier choice to use phase delays versus time delays. First up, side lobes. Uh, we saw side lobes when we did the beam sweep uh, and then we calculated um, where they would, would appear with that array factor equation. Side lobes are undesirable uh, as they point our antenna into unintended directions. But the question is, how do we get rid of them? Uh, first, let me explain an interesting principle in antenna theory, and that is that the E-field distribution across an aperture can be mapped to the far-field antenna pattern through the Fourier transform. So let's say we have a square wave signal uh, in the time domain, and it goes from uh, minus one to one. So this looks like a boxcar or a rectangular waveform. Uh, in antenna terms, we'd call it a uniform illumination. But um, so, so here's, our, here's our time domain signal from, from uh, minus one to one. Um, and the Fourier transform of that uh, square wave is this uh, sine x over x function. And then in terms of power terms, we can get the, the familiar main lobe uh, and then a bunch of side lobes. Uh, 
Note, interestingly enough, that the first side lobe is minus 13 dB down from the peak. Um, uh, and that minus 13 dB side lobe level should remind you of something very similar that we just measured on our antenna pattern. And of course, if we make this, uh, this square wave pulse uh, wider in the time domain, then the main lobe in, in the spectrum becomes much more narrow. The side lobes crowd in, uh, but the side lobe levels will remain the same. And that should also remind you of something that we just uh, looked at in our lab where we changed uh, the number of elements. So to control those side lobes on a rectangular FFT, we'll commonly apply a windowing function. Um, and, um, uh, and that windowing function brings some loss to the peak as well as broadening of the main lobe. So if we start here with this, uh, this boxcar rectangular uh, function, uh, we can see that the first uh, side lobe is, is uh, 13 dB down from the peak, but it has the narrowest main lobe. And, there are, um, and then we can apply a windowing function to that. And there are many windowing functions to choose from, but as an example, uh, here's Hanning and Blackman. Uh, Hanning brings the side, lo side lobe levels down to about minus 30 dBc. And Blackman uh, has the lowest side lobe levels, um, but you can clearly see it also has the, the widest uh, uh, main lobe. So that analysis was all for the square wave signal in the time domain, but it's basically the same in the spatial domain. If we have a uniformly illuminated antenna pattern like this, then we get side lobes. In antenna terms, windowing is tapering the power at each element down from the center towards the edge of the antenna. However, this also has the undesirable effect of broadening the main lobe, uh, just like a Blackman window will broaden the response in an FFT. So uh, tapering presents kind of an interesting dilemma. We need to taper to reduce the side lobes, but as we taper, we are widening the beam and reducing the gain of the main lobe. I mean, the whole reason we go to these, you know, 10,000 element arrays is to get a narrow beam and, and, and high gain. So tapering kind of works against us there. But let's take a look at this real time with our GNU radio program. Okay, and here is that GNU radio program. And uh, we are gonna look at beam tapering. We're gonna try to control our side lobe levels here. We're gonna try to knock them down via beam tapering. Let's do that now. I can control the individual gains of each of these four elements. We saw that last time when we switched from an N equals four to an N equals three and N equals two array. But um, I don't wanna bring these guys all the way down to zero. I just wanna taper the outside edges. There's only so much we can do with four elements because the, the inner elements should be at max gain. Uh, but we can taper the outer elements here. And uh, I'm gonna click this little button here. This button here sets, whatever I set for RX1 is also symmetric for RX4. So if I set RX1 to 63, then RX4 also set to 63, but but the, the GUI doesn't update uh, like that. So the GUI will stay stuck at 127. I, I don't know how to, how to get them to be uh, in sync like that. Anyway, so just uh, use your imagination there. As I, as I change RX1, I'm also changing RX4. And let's, uh, let's just observe what happens. So I can bring down the gain on RX1 and you can see already the side lobe level is going down quite a bit. The peak gain is also going down. Uh, but the side lobe levels are going down faster. And eventually we get to a point here where the side lobes start to become very difficult to see, but our beam is getting wider and wider. Um, our, our, our gain is getting lower and lower. And eventually we get all the way out here to zero. And of course, zero just looks like an N equals two array. It's a very wide half power beam width. So the trade-off here that we want to strike is we want to taper in such a way that the side lobes are minimized, but the main lobe isn't too broad and we don't lose too much gain on the main lobe. And exactly how that's done is, is the subject of many, many very wise papers and all kinds of experiments and research. But this is, this is the general principle of it. We, we wanna get rid of the side lobes and we want to keep as much of the narrow beam width and high gain of our main lobe as possible. So there's only so much tapering we could do with four elements, but uh, in case you're interested, if, if this was about 55, this is about a Blackman taper. This is about what a Blackman taper would look like for a four element array. And if we take it down to 30, that would look like a Hamming taper. So there's, a, there's something like a Hamming. And again, just to compare against uh, no taper at all. This is this is uh, this is no taper at all. 
and then this is something like a hamming taper. So that's the that's the power of tapering uh, for the um, minimization of side lobes. Okay, uh, let's talk about grading lobes next. Um, and these grading lobes can be thought of in a similar way uh, to aliasing in a data converter. I'm sure you remember from sampling theory that Nyquist requires at least two samples per cycle to reproduce a waveform. Now you can have fewer samples per cycle, but you'll end up with aliases in the frequency response. In a similar way, you need at least two spatial samples, which are antenna elements per wavelength to fully avoid spatial aliasing, AKA grading lobes in the visible hemisphere. And this is where the lambda over two spacing guideline comes from. But it's worth understanding uh, that guideline further because um, that guideline can and oftentimes is violated. So we need to know where it comes from and, and what its impact is. And for that, we have to do a little bit of math. So quick review of our beam angle slide, um, but this time we'll solve for the beam angle. And we do that with this arc sine function. Um, but really phase wraps around. So when we say a 360 degree phase shift, it's really the same as zero degrees. Zero degrees is the same as 360 degrees. So the real way to describe phase shift is a phase shift times how many times we've wrapped around, which, which, we, which we'll call M. So now we've got this equation here. Um, theta equals arc sine M times the phase shift times uh, two pi times lambda over D. But remember that uh, arc sine is this, this really weird function. Um, so arc sine is a sine function, but turn 90 degrees. Um, and of course that repeats on and on into infinity. Now we don't care about all these periodic solutions up here. Uh, so we bound the arc sine results between uh, plus minus half pi. Now valid arguments for arc sine must also be restricted and those are restricted to uh, plus or minus one. Anything outside of that argument, you know, the, the on the x-axis range will produce a complex, which is a non-real angle. And we don't care about non-real angles because we live in the real world, which consists of real angles. So we discard all of those complex values also. But here's the interesting part. It is possible that multiple valid arc sine arguments fall between plus and minus one. And if this happens, then it gives multiple steering angles and they will each appear with the same amplitude as the true main lobe. So let's consider some examples to explain this. Uh, and this first examples, uh, in the, for these first examples, let's assume that the steering angle is zero degrees, that is full broadside. Then the equation simplifies uh, just to this, uh, just arc sine uh, m times lambda over d. So let's try two cases for this simplified equation. <clears throat> Case one follows the D equals lambda over two spacing guideline. guideline. So a 10 gigahertz wave for, wavelength uh, gives 30 millimeters and our spacing between elements is 15 millimeters. And this gives only one valid solution. And that is only when M equals zero, do we have a result which falls within our valid arc sine boundaries. Case two changes the spacing so that D is now equal to 45 millimeters. And now we start to see a problem. There are valid solutions for M equals zero and M equals one. It means that we will literally see three main lobes. The first one is at zero degrees and that's the true lobe. And then there's these two other ones at plus minus 41 degrees. And these are the spatial aliases, AKA grading lobes. Uh, just for fun, uh, you, you could also plug in M equals two and we get uh, this complex uh, angle as it shows up over here and we ignore that, um, but that's that's where it would lie. You can do this an infinite number of times for all possible integers of M, but they will all be complex and you can ignore them all. So we can replicate this kind of experiment in this setup in our GNU radio setup and uh, we can actually see these grading lobes. Let's, let's do that now. Okay, back to our GNU radio flow graph, and now we're gonna talk about grading lobes. We had talked about to completely eliminate grading lobes within the visible hemisphere, you needed to set your element to element spacing to be less than lambda over two. And that's about what we have right now. Um, we have about a, a 30 millimeter wavelength and our element to element spacing is about 15 millimeters. So um, that's a lambda over two spacing or, or uh, D equals 0 0.5 times lambda. But we looked at two other cases where we could violate that, that spacing pretty easily with our setup. Uh, the first case is if we just kill off these two inner elements, 
Now we have a spacing not of 0 0.5 times lambda, but our spacing is 1.5 times lambda, and we will definitely see grading lobes. We calculated where those grading lobes would be. We calculated that they would be at zero degrees and plus minus 40 degrees. And um, of course, zero degrees is the main lobe. It's not a grading lobe, but it's uh, it's the main lobe. You can see from the webcam that that is where the uh, the RF source is pointed. It's at um, the broadside direction. So this is this is the true lobe. And then these other two on the on the left and right are the grading lobes. And they are, this one over here is about at 40 degrees. And this one over here is about at minus 40 degrees. So they're they're exactly where we calculated that they should be. And um, and they these are the grading lobes. We can look at some other cases too. We had done a case where we had elements one and three enabled. With elements one and three enabled, it's still an n equals two array. But now our element to element spacing is is equal to lambda, so it's not half lambda or less than half lambda like like we'd want it to be, but it's uh, equal to lambda. And when we did those calculations, we saw that we should expect to see grading lobes at uh, plus minus ninety degrees. So again, our our true lobe is in the center, and then way over here at plus ninety degrees, it kind of I think it's pretty flat, but there's a grading lobe. And then way over here at minus 90 degrees is the other grading lobe. So these are pretty extreme grading lobes. Um, but we're going to now look at, at grading lobes that occur between um, lambda over 2 and lambda spacing. And uh, we're going we're gonna to have to do a little, little bit of math to kind of understand where those come from. And then, uh, and then we'll come back and, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll measure one of those. So we just used our GNU radio program uh, and we saw some pretty extreme grading lobes, uh, but we don't often set our element spacing to greater than lambda. But as, and as we said earlier, you can get grading lobes for any spacing that is greater than lambda over two. Now, um, those grading lobes will appear as you steer towards the horizon. Um, and there's a nice mathematical explanation on why this happens uh, if you go to that uh, phased array antenna patterns um, uh, article that we've, we've referenced throughout the, throughout the workshop. Uh, but the result, the result of that derivation uh, is this equation here for the maximum element spacing. So um, less than lambda over two element spacing is required to steer the beam all the way to the horizon without seeing any grading lobes. But you could have a wider element spacing if the maximum beam, beam angle is constrained. Um, so let's use this equation here to do a little example. If we have a, a 10 gigahertz signal, that's a wavelength of 30 millimeters. So a lambda over two spacing is 15 millimeters. 15 millimeters between uh, elements uh, is what we'd want to avoid grading lobes as we steer all the way to the horizon. But um, if our signal is 10.5 gigahertz instead of 10 gigahertz, then uh, that wavelength, 10.5 gigahertz, 28.5 millimeters. So that spacing now becomes 0.53 lambda. We violated our lambda over two spacing guidelines. So if we use this equation, um, we can plug it in and we get a theta max of 65 degrees. This is telling us that we should expect to see a grading lobe on the opposite horizon as we steer the beam to 65 degrees. So we can, uh, um, we, we can try that um, now in our, in our GNU radio program. So again, we, uh, we have a signal of 10.5 gigahertz, but our antenna is spaced at 15 millimeters. And that violates our lambda over two spacing guidelines. Um, we're just a little bit, a little bit above that at 0 0.53 lambda spacing. So it's not going to be a super dramatic effect, but um, it is something that we should be able to measure here. So right now we're at mechanical bore site, zero degrees. So let's start steering towards the horizon and let's notice when, um, when that grading lobe starts to appear. And keep in mind that the, our beam widths are wide, so you'll actually see the edge of the grading lobe before you sort of see the peak of the grading lobe. We, we really want to measure the peak of the grading lobe if possible. So I'm steering now. This is probably, I don't know, 30 degrees, 45 degrees. Now we're starting to see the edge of the grading lobe on the opposite horizon. So on the right-hand side is our, is our true lobe. Um, uh, coming up on the left-hand side of the graph is the grading lobe. This, that's the edge of it. We kind of want to get to where we can sort of see the, the peak of it more than, um, more than just the side of it. It's, I guess it's some, something like there. Kind of try to lock this in. Um, and uh, we can kind of measure this here with our little iPhone app. 
and the iPhone app is measuring this at like 62 degrees. So it's a little bit hard to distinguish because that gradient lobe is so wide, but uh, we're at 62 degrees, we calculated 65 degrees, it's somewhere in that ballpark. But the more important thing is that's what the, that's what the, the gradient lobe looks like. As you steer towards the horizon, um, you'll start to see there. And, and, and that's the power of constraining the maximum beam, ang beam angle is um, if you only wanna steer to plus minus 45 degrees, you could have much uh, wider element to element spacing than, uh, than if you need to steer to say plus minus, you know, 70 or 80 degrees. So we saw that gradient lobe and it was about where we predicted it to be. Um, so that raises the question, should the element spacing always be less than lambda over two? And the answer is not necessarily. This becomes a trade-off for the intended designer to consider. If the beam is steered completely to the horizon, then theta equals plus minus 90 degrees and an element spacing of lambda over two would be required if you don't want any gradient lobes um, in the visible hemisphere. But in practice, the maximum achievable steering angle is always less than, than plus minus 90 degrees. And this is due to the element factor and other degradations at large steering angles. So being, uh, you know, being able to, to play with what that maximum distance is and then adjust your spacing accordingly allows you to kind of violate the lambda over two spacing guidelines um, with, without, any, uh, without seeing uh, those gradient lobes. Okay, our final antenna impairment topic to talk about today is beam squint. Beam squint is a defocusing of the beam across frequency, and it's a result of us using phase delays instead of time delays. We can better understand this by going back to our, uh, our earlier equations uh, and solving for the beam angle. Now we can solve for that beam angle uh, and, 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 and use a delay that is just true time or that is um, a phase shift. If it's, if it's just a time delay, this is not a function of frequency. But if we, if we use a, a phase shift as the delay, then this is a function of frequency. And that means that um, if, as we change frequency, the steering angle also changes because we're not also changing um, uh, the time that that phase shift represents. And that is beam squint. Um, it's the beam angle changing as a function of frequency. It's a defocusing of the beam uh, as you move across frequency. A true time delay beam former wouldn't have that problem uh, because it doesn't have that frequency dependence. Uh, let's calculate the magnitude of the beam squint with an example now. This is the equation to use to examine the change in steering angle across frequency. Uh, delta theta is the undesired change of steering beam angle. Theta zero is the intended beam angle. F zero is the carrier frequency and F is the instantaneous frequency. So if we have a carrier frequency of 10.5 gigahertz and the peak frequency deviation is minus 500 megahertz, then the beam will move off the intended 45 degree angle by about three degrees. And that's not really a problem if our half power beam width is 25 degrees, as is the case for our four element setup. But for a large antenna with, you know, something like a one degree beam width, then the received power will be down by many dB at the band edge. So with the beam squint problem, um, why is it that anyone uses a phase shifter over a time delay unit? Typically, this has come down to design simplicity and size of the phase shifters versus time delays. Time delays are generally implemented in some form of transmission line and the total delay needed is a function of the aperture size. To date, most available analog beamforming ICs are phase shift based, but there are families of true time delay ICs emerging and these may be more desirable for wideband high gain array implementations. Now let's take a look at a GNU radio experiment to see this beam squint effect. Okay, back to our GNU radio experiment. Okay, we're gonna try to replicate uh, that beam squint calculation that we just did that predicted a three degree beam shift with a 500 megahertz uh, deviation from the carrier frequency. Now I'll say too, this is probably uh, maybe the squirreliest of the experiments because our, our beam width is so wide. And so we're trying to pick up a three degree shift um, on a wide beam width, um, let, let's let, let's give it a try. So the first thing we need to do is we need to steer uh, over to 45 degrees, uh, just like in our um, calculation. And uh, let's see, that should be about 45 degrees there. And um, and now, um, since I can't change my RF frequency source, it's a pretty fixed 10.5 gigahertz source. Um, in order to see beam squint, what I can do though, is I can change where I calculate the beam angle at. And so that's what all these uh, numbers are down here and what the single uh, signal bandwidth um, tab means. So I can go out here to 500 megahertz 
And um, if you look real carefully, you could see just a, a slight shift in the peak here. So here it is at zero. Did you see that little shift to the left here? Here we are at 42, 43. And then if we go to uh, 500, you know, we're somewhere around 47. Again, <laughs> with, with our large, our large beam width, especially as we steer um, uh, away from mechanical bore sight, uh, it is, it's a little bit, it's not very sharp to see. It's a little more apparent if we just take it to an extreme. So instead of going to 500 megahertz, if I slam it all the way over to two gigahertz of instantaneous bandwidth, you can see now that that peak changes. Now it's something like 60 degrees, slam it all the way back to uh, no bandwidth, zero degrees. And we see this come down to like 43 degrees. So that is beam squint, a, a defocusing, a change of the beam angle with frequency, and that's a result of using phase shifters instead of uh, true time delay units. Okay, monopulse tracking is our last section and probably my favorite because we'll put a lot of things together. Uh, it should be fun. We're going to build a dual beam monopulse tracker, have it scan the sky and then lock into an RF source. So as that RF source moves, we adaptively modify the beam to keep the antenna always focused at it. And this is done real time without any inter interruption to the beam. It's a very cool principle uh, developed, I think, sometime in the 1940s. To cover all this, uh, first I'll do a simple explanation of monopulse trackers. Then we'll cover hybrid beamformers. Um, and then we'll, we'll update our, our demo to include a hybrid beamformer. But when we do that update, things uh, will get a little bit more complicated. So I want to show you how I've used X microwaves to implement this and show you how you can do instant RF layout and very rapid prototyping of more complex systems. Finally, we put it all together in GNU Radio and we'll watch it in action. So this is a lot to cover um, and let's get started. First up, uh, the basics of monopulse tracking. Um, up until now, we've swept uh, all the beam weights to determine the approximate direction of arrival. Um, in practice, this is really only done once, just to find the, uh, the approximate location of our target. Then we need to adaptively lock in and track that target. So we update the beam weights only as needed to keep the antenna focused on the target. There are many ways to do this, but the most common I think is monopulse tracking. Monopulse meaning that in one pulse or, or one snapshot of data, we can get both the desired information, you know, whether it's a radar signal or, or a comm signal, as well as information about how, how to optimally point the beam. So that sounds very cool. Um, how can we modify our GNU radio program to do that? Uh, well, let's take a look first at our current setup. Right now we have uh, this one beam here. We have our, our four elements and they all get summed together in one beam. This is all done in one 8R1000. Uh, but we could split that one beam up into two beams, a, a left and a right if we wanted to. And if we sum those beams together and, and, and if we kept the phase synchronous, then it would give, give us the same total. Um, so there's no harm done. We kind of now have two beams, but we sum them together back into one beam. Um, and it doesn't matter whether the addition is done in the analog world as it is with the 801000 or in the digital world where we digitize the elements uh, and then add them up. Uh, addition is addition, you can, you can do it however you want. So let's look at those left and right beams. Uh, and so these, these are the pink and blue traces here. Uh, and then the green is the summation of them. Each, each beam, our left and right beams, is a two element array. And you can see that they have the beam width that you would expect from a two element array. Uh, but if you added them together and kept their phase alignment, then you would see this green sum result and it would have the narrower beam width of an N equals four array. And it would look uh, just like what we had for all of our previous labs where we enabled all four elements. But if the left and right beams were not phase aligned, then, um, then when you added the beams together, you would just get a slightly higher cane version of the individual beams and they would not have the beam width of an, um, they would have the beam width of an n equals two array and they would not have the beam width of an n equals four array. This is not what we want. So make sure to keep all the beams phase synchronous. Um, that way we get the correct beam width for the number of elements that we're using. Uh, okay, now here's the interesting part. What if instead of adding the beams together, we subtracted those two beams, the left and right beam, we subtract them. Uh, this gives the Delta uh, plot line, which is shown in red here. And this sharp null here, corresponds to the, the direction of arrival peak. The sharpness of that null is much easier to distinguish than the flat peak of the sum signal. So that's, uh, that's very uh, convenient to see which direction our antenna is pointing, but it's still not a means to track the target. Uh, 
For that, we need some kind of error function where we can see how far off we are from that red null. And we can get that error function by subtracting the sum from the delta. And it gives us this, uh, this nice V shape here. So subtracting the sum from the delta, and you can see it gives us this nice V shape. Um, but even so, um, we have an error function, but we don't know what side of the error function that we are on. We know we're off if we're somewhere over here. We can see that we're off, but should we increase or decrease the phase delta? It's not clear. So now look at the phase difference between the sum and the delta. That's this trace here. Um, that's this trace here. Uh, you know, like it varies a bunch and, and, and bounces all over, but mostly we only care if it is greater than or less than zero. Uh, and specifically, just look at what happens right at the very peak of the main lobe, the phase reverses. So now we can use the sign of that shift to tell which direction to move the beam. Uh, so putting it all together, uh, here's what our cleaned up error function looks like. And this error function is the blue trace here, uh, here on the bottom. And so if we are off center, now we know exactly how much and in which direction to move the face. And we can actually modify our setup to do this in our lab. Um, but, but to do this, because we have to do a, 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 um, a, the addition and subtraction and look at the phase difference uh, of each of those, um, to do this, we need to add another ADC so that we can look at both of those beams. So this now becomes something called a hybrid beamformer system that we will learn about next. Okay, so there's basically three, I guess, classifications of beamformers, and the distinction is in where the phase shift or the time delay occurs. In an analog, uh, in analog beamforming, each element's phase shift is done in the RF domain, so uh, in the analog domain. This system has low power consumption generally uh, and, and low baseband processing. However, it's uh, less flexible and generally requires uh, calibration. This is what our lab has been so far. We have one beam, it's one ADR1000 output and one data stream, which is one ADC receive input. In digital beamforming, each antenna element has its own data converter. And this technique can handle multiple data streams and generate multiple beams simultaneously from one array. The phase shifts needed to generate the desired beams are created in the digital baseband. But we don't need to do phase shifts. Uh, we can just as easily do time delays. So, so this works to alleviate um, the beam squint problem uh, with the phase shifters. H however, this approach requires much more hardware and puts a greater burden on signal processing. It requires n sets of data converters and lots of data to process, lots of digital filtering, and uh, generally lots of power. So in hybrid beamforming, there is some combination of analog beamforming uh, for the subarrays, followed by digital beamforming for the, for the full array. And hybrid beamforming is a very popular technique as it often ends up being a, a reasonable compromise between flexibility, power dissipation, and complexity. It also offers some natural beam squint mitigation worth considering. So beam squint is only subject to the, to the subarray, um, uh, which is a much wider beam width. So it is more tolerant to beam angle deviation. Thus, as long as the, the subarray beam squint is tolerable, then the hybrid beamforming architecture can be implemented with phase shifters in the subarrays, followed by true time delay in the digital beamforming. So for our monopulse tracking, we want at least two beams. That way we can digitally add them and digitally subtract them uh, and also take the phase difference between them. So either digital or hybrid would work, but to minimize the number of data converters, uh, we'll, we'll uh, take advantage of the ADR1000 and do the hybrid approach. Um, so now to implement a monopulse um, on our, our two beam array, we're gonna need two ADR1000s and then uh, two ADC channels. And um, uh, let's talk about the, the ADC channels first. We've been using Pluto, which has one receive uh, ADC channel, but we can fairly easily upgrade to the big brother of Pluto, the ADRV 9361 uh, SOM board. Uh, and this has two receive channels. And since we used ADI's uh, LibIO drivers and, and, um, uh, and software for programming Pluto, basically all of our programming for this, this new part is about 99% the same. So here's what our setup looks like now. Um, we've added another ADR1000 chip for the second beam. Uh, and then of course we got the new 9361 SOM in there with its two receive channels. And uh, I've also added you know, a proper synthesizer here um, uh, for, for our LO just to, just to clean things up. So uh, this, this is all great, but, but it actually adds um, quite a bit of extra stuff to our setup. So this is what our eval board setup looks like now. And I've, this is 
this is on my desk. I, I've tried to make it as neat as possible, but it's still a bit messy. And it gets even more messy if we were to add in filters and LNAs and amps and, and, and all that. Um, but we've all seen this before in our labs and we've all worked on stuff like this and um, getting it to work reliably and building our actual design off of these types of setups is, is always a challenge, uh, which uh, leads me to think there has got to be a better way. If, if only we could instantly lay out an RF board uh, for all of this and have it developed as soon as possible, wouldn't that be wonderful? Okay, so let me take just a small quick break um, from talking about phase rate beam forming to talk about something else that I think is very powerful. And that is how to instantly do RF layout and build whatever you want and then have it delivered fully assembled in a matter of days. Uh, does that sound like, like anything that, that anyone out here needs? So the reason for this little detour, right, is that our setup is about to get more complicated. We need that dual channel SDR, we need another beam form, we need another mixer, <clears throat> eventually LNAs, filters, et cetera. So it's worth it to take a step back and consider how to prototype this all together. <clears throat> Let me also just say that this is my opinion based off my own experiences, analog devices, uh, John Craft Worldwide Enterprises LLC that has no stake in X microwave. Um, I bought everything you're about to see. Um, and so this is my, my unbiased opinion. I just think they're doing cool stuff. Um, and it's really a vast upgrade from the traditional rat's nests of eval boards that, that we just saw. Um, so if you've not seen their stuff before, it's pretty interesting to check out. Um, they have this very uh, cool low insertion loss uh, and clean interconnect system that gives you great RF, basically breadboarding up to 67 gigahertz. Uh, many, many manufacturers are included, um, but the largest portfolio is probably from analog devices. We have over 400 unique uh, parts in their library, uh, amplifiers, mixers, synthesizers, uh, digital step attenuators, switchers, um, et cetera. But there are many other RF components uh, makers in their systems as well. So you can get filters and couplers, splitters, references, uh, transmission lines, you know, all kinds of stuff. So their basic setup is that, um, that uh, uh, power and spy um, comes uh, from the bottom side of the board, and that leaves the uh, uh, the top side of the board pretty pristine for for all the for all the RF paths. And uh, you can combine, you know, like I said, all those parts and filters and, and everything uh, from your bench into a prototype that is much closer ultimately to what your final design is going to look like. And and prototyping and developing in a system that is closer to your final product means fewer design iterations uh, to get to that final product. So X Microwave has an ADR1000 module. It actually includes um, th these um, uh, ADTR1107 switches, which combine an LNA, a PA, and a switch. So we get so in our setup here, we're going to get upgraded to also include an LNA with the, using their uh, their module. And you can stack these modules in in, in different ways to do um, to do a four by four array, or we're just going to do a linear array. But you could do more fun things with uh, with their stuff. Okay, so now let me show you uh, some how I do RF layout in 60 seconds. So I go to the uh, X Microwave website. They have an online uh, layout tool there that just launches right in your browser. And here I'm placing the ADR1000 modules. They have the ADTR1107s built into them. So that gives us uh, the PA and LNA for each of the ADR1000 channels. Here I'm placing the mixers. These are the LTC5552 mixers. And there's also a, a mirrored layout for that mixer. So I can, I can place them back to back like that. This is the ADF4371 with 100 megahertz reference <clears throat> that I'm placing. Here's a uh, splitter for it. That's gonna take that 9.5 gigahertz LO signal that we generate. Um, it's going to split it and route it to the LO of each of those two mixers. And now I'm just kind of, you know, you're just finding transmission lines uh, to match up there. Uh, there's all kinds of different sizes and shapes uh, in the library. So you, you just find whatever sizes you need and put them in there. And uh, finally, I'll add SMA connectors. And these are my launch points. And this is what the completed layout looks like. RF layout in 60 seconds. And now let me show you how I build the entire prototype in 90 minutes, but I've compressed it down to 30 seconds. Uh, here's a little time lapse of it. So after doing the layout, I, uh, I ordered uh, those parts. They gave me a little bomb and um, now I'm placing them. Of course, you can see the eight or 1000 modules on the left and right there, the synthesizer there in the middle. I'm adding all the SMA launches. These will connect to the um, patch antenna. There's all my uh, transmission lines. Now I'm, I'm connecting all those little those uh, little jumpers. Um, 
they're not uh, they're not too tricky to install. They just first few took me a little bit of practice, but but after that uh, they're not too bad, and the insertion loss on them look great. Adding out the SMA uh, connectors on the back side is where power and ground goes. So I, I wrote all that stuff. And that's what the finished design looks like. And finally, this is what our completed setup now looks like using the X microwave solution and the ADRV 9361 SOM. It is uh, much cleaner, much, uh, much nicer. We've added added a synthesizer, we've added LNAs to all the receive inputs. Uh, we could also add in filtering um, here if we wanted to pretty easily. So that's what our setup looks like now. And it's very clean and orderly, um, but also much closer to the layout and schematic um, of what ultimately, you know, some end product uh, would look like. So uh, let's take a look at this live right now in GNU Radio. And here is our updated GNU Radio flow graph for the ADRV 9361 implementing our monopulse tracking error function. I'll show you that GUI here in a minute. But uh, of course, we've added a number of additional GUI sliders for all the additional elements. Now, instead of a four element array, we have an eight element array. So we have, we have eight phase sliders and eight gain sliders. But other than that, the major difference is in the Python program here. Uh, but really the only, I mean, the, the major difference of that Python program is just that with the 9361, we have two receive channels. So we, we grab a buffer of data using this command. And then we separate it into channel one and channel two, just RX1 and RX2 data. We can then easily create a, a sum channel, just the addition of those two and a delta channel, the subtraction of those two. Everything else is, is pretty much the same. We, we calculate the FFT magnitude and we find that peak uh, just as we did before. The only other addition, and I guess probably the most important one, is we now also look at the phase delta um, at that peak between the sum and the delta channel. Uh, this phase difference uh, we plot out. I don't actually plot out uh, the radians of it, although although you could, but really all we need is, is the, is the um, polarity of it. So let's see what this what this looks like. Okay, I'll give you a moment to digest this. The blue ch the blue line here is the sum channel. That's the addition of RX1 and RX2. So that's the total of all eight elements. That's an n equals eight linear array. The red is the delta channel. That's RX1 minus RX2. And of course, this this deep null here points to exactly um, where the uh, the steering angle is. On the bottom, uh, there's 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 two uh, things plotted. First is the the phase polarity. So this is the uh, the polarity delta between the sum and the delta channel, and that's plotted out here. And you can see it makes a an abrupt transition from uh, uh, from negative to positive uh, exactly at the steering angle. And then the other one that's plotted is an error function. The error function isn't, isn't necessary. Um, uh, the phase delta is more important. The error function gives some idea about how far off you are from the, the peak of the antenna gain. And uh, we, can, we can move this around back and forth. It'll look, look very similar to, to our other, um, just a few more lines to draw, but it should look very similar to our other antenna plots. Everything tracks with it. I mean, you can see the quality of the, the peaks uh, is, is much more, is, is uh, better defined. The nulls are much deeper. Um, you know, the side lobes are more clearly defined. They're at the proper amplitudes. A lot has been improved by switching to the X microwave setup and, uh, and adding a, a proper synthesizer to the LO of our mixer. So this is uh, just a much, much cleaner, cleaner waveform. Okay, now the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take this error function here and we're gonna use that to implement uh, a tracking routine. So now that we can tell which way we need to shift the phase, we're gonna use this to implement a closed loop tracker to track an object and, um, and do that without continuously sweeping the, the phase delta. We're gonna only change the phase when needed based on when the object moves. So that will be the next uh, getting radio flow graph.
So this is our final GNU radio flow graph. And uh, this is the tracker graph. This is essentially the same as the last flow graph, except that now we do something to respond to that error function. And we only update the bean weights as necessary based on the movement of the object. <clears throat> so we can go ahead and run this. So now what you're seeing is sort of an elevation waterfall plot of sorts. Um, it'll make more sense here in a second. But um, we kick things off by scanning. Now this scan does cycle through all of the um, all of the possible phase states, just as we did before. And then it identifies uh, which one is, is at the peak. So this is kind of our direction of arrival checker. But after it, after it does that scan and identifies it, it only updates the beam weights. It only changes the phase based on movement of the RF source. So as I move over to the right, you can see that that, that angle is changing. And then as I move over to the left, um, it follows. And, and it's, if we could log all the spy rights and stuff here, you would see um, that phase is only changing based on, um, based on when, this move, when this moves. We're, we're no longer continuously sweeping and doing direction of arrival like that. And uh, of course, applying, <clears throat> I think I did apply um, some, uh, some beam taper uh, to this just to, just to clean up uh, the nulls and make sure that we were tracking on the right one. But so if we track off to the side there and we, uh, we hit scan max angle, it should come back and find it again. If we, if we don't uh, have, yeah, here's, here's a tapering profile uh, that I did, but let's, let's do something. Let's, let's take off that tapering profile and see if we can't get it into a state where it doesn't, uh, it doesn't properly identify its position, i.e. We're, we're tracking to one of the, the, the side lobes instead of to the main lobe. And you can do that because there's, like we saw before, there's lots of kind of error functions. So here's, if, we, if I, if I kind of maybe do something, kind of get it off course, that's working pretty good. Okay, so here we go. Now, by taking it way, way off into the right there, kind of off into the horizon, and then returning it to the broadside direction, it now is tracking to a side null over here at minus, uh, over here at um, plus 30 degrees instead of tracking to mechanical bore site. So, so this is just because we, uh, we got rid of that taper and there's, uh, there's some side lobe there. And just for fun, I'm going to do uh, one more quick demo here for you. And uh, that is to track this cable car. The RF source, our little HB100 is now mounted on this little toy cable car. And uh, we're going to see how well it tracks. Tracks it back and forth. This is just for fun. We already proved that the tracking works. So the string, you know, kind of jostles it around a little bit. So you kind of see that at the, at the end when it kind of crashes into those stops as it kind of moves back and forth. And uh, with that grand finale, um, I think that about brings us to our conclusion. Okay, uh, that's about it. Uh, hopefully we accomplished our goals of gaining an intuitive understanding of beam forming concepts, uh, had some fun with hands-on experimenting with these concepts, and thirdly, saw how to quickly prototype uh, our own phase array systems. Uh, there are better explanations and nicer derivations of most of this in the Analog Dialog se uh, article series um, that you can find online. Um, and also in, in Analog Dialog, there's, there's many other great uh, phase array uh, papers in there. So I hope this was uh, interesting and helpful to you, and thanks everyone for your time. Uh, let's, let's see if there's any questions. I, I do have the live demo set up. If there's anything I went through too quickly that uh, you're curious about, I, as I was watching it here, like, oh, I forgot to say something about this or that. Um, I did see a question about phase match cables. Um, that is a very good question. I I can afford X microwave, but I cannot afford phase matched SMA cables. So so no, the cables were just the the, the cheapo DigiKey uh, SMA <laughs> SMA bulk cables. Um, but then what I did is I did a little. Um, a, little, a simple little phase calibration where um, I tried to null out the the cable, the phase shift from the cables. I tried to null out 
and that makes a big difference on the overall beam pattern. And then, so you're doing some system level calibration, which gets rid of those effects. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And most of that, most of that mismatch comes from the cable, although some of it is also from um, the mixer and I suppose from the transmission lines. And there's some uh, like the the nine, the ADRV nine thousand one typically requires some system level calibration as well. Okay. Yeah. The the, the new transceiver. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll, um, uh, since Robin is commenting, I'll put no, 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 no. The the um the the phase array chip. Oh, the ADR the A, the ADR one thousand. Yeah. Okay. The ADR one thousand. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, yes, AD, yes. the ADAR one thousand, which is the worst part number ever. Yes. Um, the ADRV nine thousand nine psalm that Robin and his team have done. Um, if you look at that, that's four receive channels, four transmit channels, all phase synchronous. And Robin's got an excellent uh, Wiki Analog article for how to phase synchronize four of those channels together. Um, so that's that's another good resource. Yeah, there was there was a question about um, uh, the linear arrays exhibit front to back. Uh, linear arrays front to back. What, what does that mean? Uh, well, so I'm assuming is there if you go off, off axis from the array, what happens? Oh yeah, yeah. That okay. Yeah, uh, gr great point. So I make I am careful to be on axis where my beam is aligned with that array. If my polarity is off, you're going to see a big uh, a big drop in the antenna gain because uh, it's a polarized antenna. And if I'm off axis, if I've shifted over, you know. Uh, you know, six inches or something like that, you know, in the plus or minus direction, then I'll also see a big, a big degradation there because the patch antennas are, are, are fairly directional along that axis. Now, normally you wouldn't just have a linear array. You'd have, you'd have more arrays to kind of, to give you some, some freedom for the uh, both X and Y movement. Then uh, the next question was like, what about broadband beam forming? So as sample rate goes up, how do things scale? Oh, you mean is is that you think in reference to so so, so the sprint and true time oh, delay? Yes. Yeah. So we we were doing everything right now with CW, right? That's right. So, That's right. so very low you put, yeah, Assume you are doing this with a um, fifty megahertz or hundred megahertz wide OFDM signal, which is going to be you know fairly constant amplitude on the top. Sure. Like how do things scale to that as opposed to CW? Yeah, yeah. Certainly as you get out into those those higher bandwidths, then you that that beam squint presents itself as inner symbol uh, interference. And so of course both your and then also your gain, of course, you would want to be flat across that um that area too. Right. And because you'd want your beam to be wide enough to capture the entire signal all at once without um, having to do too much equalization on it. Yeah, that's true. And so you'd also want to make sure that your antenna design was such that your uh, you, the, the the element factor, you know, so we've been working on the array factor, but the element design, the element factor would have to be such that it could encompass that kind of beam with, you know, 100 megahertz, 500 megahertz, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm trying to think. There's a lot of people saying, "Is like, was there a reference to phase coherence by Robin a few reference ago?" Oh, um, maybe the 9009 sum. Oh, maybe yeah. So the so somebody asked about um, earlier about you know doing this on other hardware. It's like, yeah, th this is most of this is uh, theoretical and math, and it would work with other hardware. Um, you could do this all digitally with um, a, a multi-channel radio, like a four-channel radio or eight-channel radio, like some of the uh, USRPs are, the USERPs. Um, you could use, the, or like John showed with the uh, the mixers and, uh, and uh, analog beam formers as well. It just depends how much computation you want to do, but it's, it's all scalable. It's just kind of math. Um, if I wanted to track a quad popular by its 10 megahertz downlink, is this possible? And I think the ants like it depends on the frequency and your antenna elements is like um so the ten megahertz is probably at the two point four gigs, so your antenna elements would scale based on that frequency as well. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, what, one more comment on phase synchronization. Uh, Bobby Smith did a great presentation. Uh, Bobby Smith from Epic Solutions. Yes. On the on the X4, where he does a phase synchronization measurement, and um, it was really really well done. A great tutorial on how to make that measurement in, in very practical ways. That's the um, Epic Sidekick X4 that he was talking about, and and that that uses uh, two ADRV 9009s, so it gives you four receive channels, four transmit channels, all 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 phase aligned. So that would be another another good choice if you wanted to do a digital beamformer or more channels of a of a hybrid beamformer. Right, that with wider than what some of these other systems allow. Yeah, so that would be, be, be yeah. two hundred megahertz of two hundred megahertz. Bandwidth. Yeah, yeah. But but that makes your FFTs take longer, and it makes uh, the system has to scale in terms of performance. Like right now, you're doing everything in software. In those kinds of systems, you may want to do more in the FPGA. I would have to upgrade my Raspberry Pi. Yes, Raspberry yeah. Pi uh, 100 or something. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the software load? Uh, if you just bring up a terminal and type top or H top, what is uh, what's the load on the Raspberry Pi right now? Oh, man, I don't know. I've never done that. Just H top. Yeah, H top. If you have that installed. Yeah. Well, okay. I guess I do. Oh, well, that's not bad. Yeah. So it's plugging along on one core, probably doing most of the capture. But uh, the rest of it is so yeah. So you can still do, you can still do more stuff on here for sure. And if you threaded the Python stuff properly, you'd be able to get better too. So uh, if I was smart enough to thread Python, I'd uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of problems would be solved for me. Yeah. Um, well, cool. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. I hope we got to all of the questions. Um, I appreciate all the all the all the feedback and all the questions and and the interest throughout the. Up to two hours. I know it's kind of long, and there's kind of a lot of math. And I, I, I'm glad to see I didn't lose anybody with the weird arc sign stuff. Um, oh, come on, man! You, like all this is just algebra. <laughs> it's not really math yet. So you have like double it's integrals. Not, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's 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 enough math for me. Uh, Robin, I think, can tolerate a little more math, but. <laughs> Um, no, I really appreciate yeah. everybody's time and patience. This has been great. Yeah, uh, thanks, everybody.